Today we'll talk about quadratic functions, and we know quadratic functions basically make parabolas. Uh, in general, the most basic form of quadratic function looks like the form ax squared plus bx plus c. We've already factored things like this before. Um, we have certain points on these parabolas or quadratics, whatever we want to call them, that are very important. Anytime the function crosses the x-axis, those are the x-intercepts. Basically, we'll have a number and a zero for the y value. Uh, we'll have a y-intercept, in which case we have a zero and a number. The vertex, which is pretty much a point that a line of symmetry will go through, and then obviously all the points on the parabola. So if we want to graph a parabola in this form, and the graph has the equation like such, uh, we have to remember back to Algebra 1. In algebra 1, we learned that the x portion of the vertex, I call it vx, is equivalent to negative b over 2a. And in using these numbers given to us, we have the opposite of 4 over 2 times negative 2, which is 1. And that gets us the x-coordinate of the vertex. So let's just do this, vertex. And let's throw a 1 right there. To get the y-coordinate of the vertex, we're basically going to go f of 1, or plug the 1 in and get the y out. So we have a negative 2 times 1 squared plus 4 times 1 plus 7, which ends up with a negative 2 and a 4, which is 2, plus 7 is 9. And we get a vertex of 1 and 9. Now here's the deal. Freshman year, it's likely that you plugged back into this formula about two more times and got two other points on this side of the line of symmetry because we know that line of symmetry is going to be somewhere or is going to be on this line right here. All right. Um, but now I'm claiming there's no point in doing that anymore because we know that this a right here is the same a we had in our parent functions. And we know that for an x squared function, we have values of 2 of the negative type, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. The output values of 4, 1, 0, 1, and 4. However, in this case, we have an a value of a negative 2. So therefore, that's our y multiplier. And we multiply, we get negative 8, negative 2, 0, negative 2, and negative 8. And we can do those all from this vertex point. That's like our translated point. So in doing so, I move over 1 and down 2 on both sides. And then I move over 2 and down 8 puts me right around here. And I know that I've done this right pretty much by using this pattern that we've been going through because one of the points happens to be at 0, 7, which is my y-intercept. And to get your y-intercept, you set x equal to 0. And what do you know? There's 0, 7. All right, now we're going to find another way to do this. We could still do the negative b over 2a to graph this, but we're going to put our equation in this form. And we're going to get a perfect square in the problem. And in order to get perfect squares, we did this for the circles, we're going to take and complete the square. However, in this case, since we're not solving an equation, we're going to do it a little bit differently. So instead of bringing the 4 and isolating the constant term and the variable terms, like we did in the circle, we're going to take and 
isolate the variable terms in its own separate holding tank, if you will, and then we're going to put the four outside of that. So notice everything's on one side of an equation. I take half the middle term and square it, which gives me a nine. Now I'm going to take and add that nine to the interior of this term here. And I don't want to really touch this side of the equation. So if I'm going to balance the right side, if I add nine, I have to subtract nine, All right? And again, if I were using both sides of the equation, I'd add nine to this side, but I'm not. So I have to, if I add nine, subtract nine to keep it balanced. Therefore, I have x plus three quantity squared minus five is equal to f of x. And I know how to graph that because we've talked about transforming functions. I just move over, we've got a vertex of negative three and negative five and there's my negative three and negative five goes down to here and then I have a pattern of x squared so two one zero negative one negative two four one zero one four from this point a term is 1, so no multiplication is necessary. Over 1, up 1. Over 2, up 4. Just going to check real quickly. Check the point negative 1, negative 1 in the original equation. So this is negative, or this is positive 1 after I square it, minus. 6, actually it's plus, yeah, minus 6, and plus 4, which equals negative 1, so it's checked out. Now they also want me to find the minimum value or maximum value, whichever occurs. Since this is a lowest point, this is a minimum value. And we know that that minimum value is going to be the y value, which is negative 5. Again, we're going to convert to vertex form and then find the x-intercepts when we're done. So let's do that. Uh, in order to complete the square, we have to make sure that that coefficient in front of x is a 1. So f of x is equal to, I pull out a 3, I have x squared plus 4x. I pulled the 8 out, so I don't need to worry about factoring out of the 8. Take half the middle term, square it, end up with 4. I'm going to add 4 to this side. And like in the other problem, you'd think, okay, well, I just subtract 4 over here. Not so fast. This 3 affects this 4 because it's multiplied. So what I've really added is 12, so I've got to subtract 12. Therefore, f of x equals 3 times the quantity of x plus 2 squared minus 4. Notice my a term. Here's my h term and my k term. So therefore, I've got a vertex of negative 2, negative 4. Plot that. Got an a value. You said again of 3. So when I look at my pattern, 2, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2, 4, 1, 0, 1, 4, I have to multiply by a 3. So I get 12, 3, 0, 3, 12. Over 1, up 3. Over 2. 12 and that guy's graphed. I know it's right because I had a 0, 8 here 
and that's my y-intercept because set equal set x equal to zero and we get eight. Now I need to find the intercepts. And there's a couple ways you can do this. All right. And notice the intercepts don't look like they're going to be real numbers or they're, they're going to be real numbers. I'm sorry, but they don't look like they're going to be uh, rational. So it's probably not going to factor is my guess. Um, but I could look at this and see if it's going to factor just by inspection. I know if I started my five step, I'd want to know what multiplies to 24 and gets 12. 6 and 4 won't work, and neither will 8 and 3, so I'd have to use a quadratic formula. So the x-intercepts we get by setting y equal to 0, 3x squared plus 12x plus 8. And once again, I know that's not going to factor, so I then go to my quadratic formula, opposite of 12 plus or minus the square root, 12 squared minus 4 times 3 times 8 over 6, which gets me negative 12 plus or minus root 144 minus 12 times 8, which I believe is still 96 over 6. We take 144 and subtract 96. Then we get 48. This is negative 12 plus or minus root 48 all over 6. I can simplify this a little bit to negative 12 plus or minus. Biggest perfect square in here is a 16, so that's 4 root 3 over 6. I'll factor out a uh, let's go, let's factor out a 2, because I think that's the only thing that's going to help in this case. Uh, 2, and get a negative 6, plus or minus 2 root 3. So over 6, these both reduce. And then my final answer for my x-intercepts is negative 6, plus or minus 2 root 3 over 3. I could pull out a 2, but no sense because it won't reduce. All right. So next, we're going to take and write the equation rather than graph of a parabola having a vertex of 2, 1, and it passes through this point. Now, this is as simple as plug and chug because I know y equals a x minus h squared plus k, and I have everything that I need because here's h, k, and here's x and y, and I can find my a value. So we'll take 19, set it equal to a, 5 is my x, h is a 2, k is a 1. This gives me a 9a plus 1 is equal to 19. 18 equals 9a, and 2 equals a, so y is equal to 2 times x minus 2 squared plus 1. Now, if you were asked, this doesn't ask, but if you were asked to put this in standard form, which is ax squared plus bx, Plus C. This is known as vertex form. Standard form, not too hard. You just expand everything. So this is 2 times x squared minus 4x plus 4 plus 1 or 2x squared minus 8x. There's 8 and 1 is 9 is equal to y. All right, now the next few problems are going to be a little more difficult, okay? These are word problems that involve finding maximum and minimum values, and we're going to use a calculator to help us at the end. So, it says we've got 1,020 feet of fencing to enclose a rectangular plot, all right? And we don't want to fence along the side of some river that this exists on. Let's say the river is over here, all right? Uh, and we split into three parallel rectangular sections. 
All right, what's the largest area we can enclose? Well, a couple of things I need to know. I need to know the length and the width, and I don't have either one. So we're going to call one, let's go X, and another Y. And I'm calling X this height. So I know this is X, this is X, and this is X as well. And I know I have 1,020 feet, so 1,020 is really equal to 1, 2, 3, 4 X's and a Y, because all that is fencing. And they want me to find the largest area. Well, I know the area, this is a perimeter equation, if you will. I know the area is equal to basically length times width. So A equals XY. Now, I've got two equations, can't solve it. We're gonna have to again go into our bag of tricks even though we haven't talked about it yet. I don't know why this book presents all this stuff so early, but it does. So we're gonna have to use a substitution. I know that 1020 minus 4x is equal to y. So therefore, I can express the area in terms of one variable x. All right. Now, I can, if I want, multiply this together. In so doing, you will see that 1020x minus 4x squared gives us an equation for the area, and this equation is really a parabola going like this, which means I can find a maximum. All right, and that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be finding the high point of this. But I don't wanna go through and go negative B over 2A and all that kind of stuff because we're gonna get some other problems coming up that aren't necessarily quadratics. All right, so I'm gonna use our calculator to help us out. So here's the calculator, we go to y equals, and we plug in our equation of x minus, or times 1020 minus 4x. We're gonna graph that, and we're going to do that in our standard window as normal. I'm going to go zoom and six. Now what you're gonna notice is that we aren't gonna see much except for this like straight line right here, which isn't so great, all right? I'm gonna need to see a parabola. So again, looking at our graph right here and then our equation, I know that this equation, first of all, has a y-intercept of zero, which this graph does show me. All right. However, I know it's going to go pretty high because I know at the point one, for instance, this is 1020 minus four. So it's it's higher than 1020. So what I've got to do to see that graph and I notice it's not even coming down over here. And if you think about it, OK, this graph is going to be huge because I'll take an say, well, I could go, before this goes negative, if you think about an actual domain, I could go a little higher than 250 for my x before this x value goes negative. Because if I plug 250 in for x, you'll notice that this gets 1,000, all right? And then times 250, 1020 minus 1,000 is 20 times 250, huge number still. So I'm gonna have to guess super big for my window, all right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take and just for fun, try this out. Let's go from x equals negative 10. We don't need a negative 10. We could actually go from zero, but I'm gonna go negative 10 anyways. And I'm gonna go, oh, a little bit more than 250. Let's go 260 because that will get me under the axis. And then I'm going to make my Y value huge. I'm going to make it 30,000. And then I'm going to go ahead and graph that. So my window has changed. 
I notice, well, here's my graph. It goes up, and then it's going to come down. So I see the start and the end, but I don't see the high point. It looks like I got a long way to go. So I'm going to go back and change my window. Just for funsies, let's go to 80,000. It's probably too big, but that's okay. Hit graph. And what do you know? There's my whole graph. And I want to find this maximum value up here. So we've done this before. Calculate the maximum. It says go to the left bound, so left of the high point. I'll go right around here. Hit enter. Right of the high point. Hit enter. After I'm at that right spot, it asks to guess, which we never do. And then we hit enter again. And we get a value of 127.5 and 65025. Alright. So let's write that down and we'll blow this up a little bit. This point is at 127.5 and 65025. Let's talk about the meanings of these values. All right. Well, this is like our x coordinate, and I want to make sure it's our x coordinate. So I look at the, what I just graphed, and it says when x equals this, the area equals this. So this is my x value. However, this isn't my y value. When x equals whatever x is, y is going to represent my area. So this is my area. Thus, max area. is going to be 65,025. When I have these sides being 27.5. Not a super simple problem. And we've got another one to follow it up. All right, so now we're gonna deal with a geometrical figure. And it says find the dimensions of a box with a square base and an open top. So let's draw that. something like this. Let's assume that that's a square base and an open top. Uh, and we want to find a maximum volume and we know that this thing can be built for 2400 and the material on the base costs eight dollars a square foot. Material on the sides costs four dollars a, or it's not square foot, square meter, and sides cost $4 a square meter. So I'm going to have to have some dimensions for this. Square box, I know they both have to be the same. So this is X, and let's call this X. There's no relationship in the height to the base, so we're going to call that Y. So I know that I'm looking for a volume, and that's equal to the area of the base times the height. All right, so two variables, that's going to be a problem, and I don't have anything in here yet. And then I know it's going to cost me something per how big the sides are. Well, we're talking about each side being a little bit different, and it's based on a square meter, so that's a surface area. So let's talk surface area first. Surface area of this, remember, I only have a bottom, not a top is x squared, and each side has an area of x, y, but there's four of them. So that's my surface area. Now it tells us there's a cost involved with each surface. Okay, the bottom cost me eight bucks per square meter, and the sides cost me four dollars per square meter. So now I know the cost of this whole thing is 2400. So we have one equation, two equations that we can use, but again, notice this is not going to be a quadratic anymore. We're probably going to have a cubic or maybe even some kind of a fraction. So let's go through and solve this guy. I need to maximize the volume. In order to do that, I need to find a y value 
here in terms of x, which I can get from using this equation. All right, so let's go through and solve this equation. And we'll solve it for y. So I have 16xy is equal to 2400 minus 8x squared. And then I'll take and say y equals 2400 minus 8x squared over 16x, like so. All right. And therefore, my maximum volume is equal to x squared times 2400 minus 8x squared over 16x. And I'll clean that up a little bit and say that's the same as x times 2400 minus 8x squared over 16. I'm just reducing a little bit. All right, and we have to maximize this. So this is going to create a graph. So again, we're going to go to our calculator. So in the calculator, you'll notice how I've typed this in. One thing that you have to be very, very clear about is that your entire numerator has to be in parentheses when you're dealing with variables. And then your entire denominator, since this is only one term, but your entire denominator should be in parentheses as well. If I had like 16 minus x down here, I'd want to put the 16 minus x in parentheses. All right. So I'm just going to type it in this way rather than distributing the x in. Um, just makes my life easier so I don't make any multiplication errors. So rather than graphing this and then saying, hey, this didn't fit the window because it's not going to, I'm going to try to estimate what would be a good window based on the fact I know I have to have a positive volume. If I get eight times X squared and that happens to be more than 2400, I get a negative volume, it won't make any sense. So I know that I need a number for X that's gonna get this close to total of 300 um, and let's see 15 squared that's a little short 16 17 18 20 squared is too much that's 400 let's go uh, 18 for x we'll make it that big and then I'm gonna say my y value is gonna be huge so let's go to our window and we said 18 should be our x I'm going to make my min zero because we don't need negative x values. I'll make this 18 and let's just for fun make the volume 20,000. That may be too big. And we'll go ahead and graph that. So there I go graphing. 20,000 was really big, but you're seeing that I'm getting some form of a you know, maximum value right here. So I'm going to bring that Y value way down just so I can find my maximum a little easier. And I'm going to make it a lot less than 20,000. Uh, let's go 6,000. And I'll graph that. And that's good enough to find a decent maximum, which is going to be right around here. So we'll go ahead and find our maximum. And we'll call that the left side going to the right side and hitting it again. And we see, let's call that 10 and 1,000. All right. So now we'll say, all right, well, we know that we have a max volume. All right, because they want us to find the dimensions and that max volume was a thousand when X was equal to 10. So if I know X is equal to 10 and I know I have a volume of a thousand. All right, then all I have to do is take this equation. And we said X was 10. 
and solve for y. So in order to do that, I divide 1,000 by 100, and I get 10. So this is actually a cube, right? Not a super simple day in the second half. The first half was a little bit of review thrown in with a little bit of new stuff and completing the square. Uh, but uh, it'll be a good day to discuss when we get back to class.